Happy New Year. Good morning. Hope your day is uh, your day and your new year have gotten off to a a good start. Uh, you know, catastrophe has already jumped into your life or overshadowed the blessings that are there. And um, um, as I told the first service this morning, you you have perfect attendance for the new year. So it's always a good way to start, isn't it? And I hope you with me will do your level best other than vacations and illnesses to, to be here every Sunday that you can. And uh, it's really important for, uh, for your growth and the growth of your church family. And uh, so again, off to a good start. Congratulations. Uh, this morning we began a very new series. Um, you see some of the information there at the uh, back of your bullet on the top. And um, just really uh, wanting to get off in the new year and to talk about some things that are incredibly important. And uh, today, uh, the kind of the theme text for today uh, is in John chapter 17, verse 3. So if you did bring a Bible um, or you have the electronic version, feel free to, uh, to go to that point. Uh, we'll be using that text um, a little bit later in the message. Maybe you've heard about the little boy in his uh, Sunday Bible school class who was uh, working very diligently with crayons and paper, had this very determined look on his face, and you could tell he was just ninja-focused on what he was doing. You know, just everything about his body language and what he was doing, and he's just working so diligently. And, of course, it caught the eye of the teacher because... There are others in the class that weren't doing anything like that. So, you know, she kind of picked at him. She says, what are you drawing? And uh, without even looking up, he said, uh, a picture of God. And the teacher said, but Tommy, no one knows what God looks like. And continuing to draw, he replied in the great seriousness, he says, well, they're going to know when I'm finished. <laughs> you know, at times the idea of of knowing God seems, seems impossible. Um, God is infinite. He doesn't have limits. Uh, he's really beyond our ability to measure as human beings. And theologians, these are people who study God for a living, uh, use impressive words to describe God's infinite qualities. They talk about things like God is eternal that means he's unlimited by time. He has no beginning and no end. He's always existed and that kind of baffles our mind right out of the gate. And then they say he's omniscient. Omniscient. In other words, he, he knows everything. There's nothing God does not know. There's no thought you're thinking right now or I'm thinking right now God doesn't know and didn't know 20 minutes ago what we'd be thinking at this moment. He's unlimited in what he knows. He's omnipotent, they say. That means he can do anything consistent with his nature and purpose. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere at the same time. And, you know, as we think about these things in our limited mortal minds, God is not only bigger than we imagine, he's bigger than we can imagine. I hear people call things awesome today, and I know it's just become a term, but to me, God is the only real awesome thing. I mean, he's just awesome. You know, I think about God, and I, I'm just overwhelmed. I know you are too. And some will consider it presumptuous for finite human beings to say that we can know the infinite God. In the Old Testament, one of Job's friends re rebuked him with these words in Job 11. He says, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Zophar the Naamathite who said these words to Joe, one of his friends. There's certainly some truth in his questions. There's a lot of things we, we can't really understand. 
I like what Jack Cottrell wrote in his book, The Faith Once for All. He said, because he is infinite and transcendent, God would forever be beyond our ability to discover him and to know him if he chose to keep himself hidden from us. But this has never been his purpose. God wants us to know him. Thus he has revealed himself to us. Though we will never have a complete knowledge of God, we can indeed have true knowledge of him thanks to his own gracious initiative. Our ability to know God becomes an issue with people who are agnostic. People that are agnostic would say that there may be a God. We don't know for sure. But it doesn't really matter because we can't know him. He's just kind of out there if he's there. And we don't understand and we don't know what he wants from us. So all we know is we're alive right now and we've got to work on the existence that we currently have and to make it as good as possible. It's kind of the mindset of the agnostic. This God that they refer to is not a personal God. God is an impersonal force. Or the man upstairs. Or the higher power. But he's not a personal God. You know, the Bible describes God quite differently. And in this series, we're going to look, this is one of those, but in this series, we're going to look at four subjects that the Bible teaches that are in direct conflict with what we hear in our culture. And it's important for us to understand why our culture is in the shape that it's in. And that we very much need to understand and practice what God teaches us in his word. And so we begin today by talking about the Bible's teaching on one true God that can be known. Again, I'm using the outline on the back of your bulletin. Please feel free to use that if you brought something to write with. There's blanks to fill in. There's those of you that like to guess ahead of time what it is the blanks fill in are going to be because you're just those kind of people. You applaud yourself, pat yourself on the back if you get it right. <clears throat> but it's also a great place to write down some scriptures that you want to look up later that you don't have time to, to write down exactly what all is there and take a few notes that that you think might be helpful to you it also helps keep your mind engaged the first thing we find is that God can be known because he has revealed himself God can be known because he has revealed himself you know we have different ways to communicate as human beings we can express ourselves for instance simply with gestures and sounds if I do this, a lot of you look over there because you think something's over there, you know. Obviously there's not, but I just want to give you an example. If I do this, you probably will figure out I'm not happy about something. You, you know that in a general sense. You really don't know exactly what I'm unhappy about, but you know I'm unhappy. I could be thinking about one of those passes that the Louisville Cardinals threw that were picked off by a Georgia defender in the game. Or I could just be thinking about the contacts I went to pick up Friday and they told me it would be 10 more days before they come in. I could be thinking about a lot of different things. But you don't know specifics. You see in general that I'm really not happy. But you don't know specifically why. You see, God communicates to us in a general sense as well. He communicates in what is called by many scholars general, general revelation. Call <laughs> them general revelation. Because all people in a general sense can experience it. We know in Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this can be observed by all people. You know, if you're a golfer, and I don't know how many of you out there fit the bill. I know there's some of you. But if you're a golfer and you see a golf course that has 18 well-manicured greens, and you see 
traps that are positioned in kind of neat places to make the course a little more challenging. And you notice the tea boxes are in good placements and they're well taken care of and, and they drain well. And you, and you see fairways that, that are just gorgeous and well maintained. You don't say, wow, what an accident occurred here. You think, who designed this course? Who went to all the time to, to design this? It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's a great golf course you're immediately drawn to assume there's a designer. Now when you go larger picture than that, and you think about the multifacets of this entire universe, and you look at the complexities of the human body, <laughs> you're drawn to say, this isn't an accident. This is the work of a purposeful designer. When we see order, we assume a designer. Psalm 19, 1 and following says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. The psalmist is talking about general revelation. That message that is there for every person that just simply looks around them or experiences of any of the senses that God has given us. This is the work of a creator God. General revelation, though it's a wonderful gift, has its limitations. It is nonverbal. And thus, it is less precise than revelation that would come, information that would come in words. It's also limited in the content that it can express, how specific that it can be. In other words, nature can tell us that as we look around us that God is powerful and he has an amazing imagination. But it comes up short in revealing specific things like you and I need a savior. And God's plan to save us. We're not going to figure that out looking at a beautiful sunset. Or a rainbow arching across the sky. Or a display of multicolored butterflies. We're going to be impressed. But we're not going to understand those types of things. And so God, in his great wisdom, has used the spoken and written word to convey things that need language to give them meaning and fullness. When God needs to convey things that need more clarity and call for a very specific response. I mean, how effective would have it been if God had used charades, for instance, to teach us about his character? to teach us about sin, to show us how to live, to teach us why Jesus' death for us on the cross was the only way that we could find forgiveness. How would you like to tackle that one? But God knew the superiority of the spoken and written word to convey the information and so much more. He's provided this through his written word, the Bible. And because of God's written word, we can know where we came from, that God knows how to create a very perfect place. He did in the beginning. He's preparing one for the life beyond this one, that we have no secrets from him, that he knows how to meet needs, that, and someday his son is going to return to judge the world and to take his children home. In his word, he teaches us about love and truth and goodness and holiness and family relationships and the role of government as it's meant to be in society. We can know these things because God has revealed them. And they call for a very specific response. 
but we can know God because he's chosen to reveal himself. Secondly today, we live in a battle of world views. A battle of world views. God warned us that Satan is a very deceptive liar and there's no truth in him. And we're encouraged as God's people to stand for truth, to love the truth, to defend the truth. And truth is important in every single day of life. There are no friendships that will continue without truth. There's no marriages that will continue without truth. Truth is important to airplane pilots. It's important to pharmacists. It's important to bankers and surgeons and engineers and judges and teachers. I don't care what realm of life you look in, truth is crucial. It's foundational. Without it, nothing can hold together. And spiritual truth should be critically important to anybody who's seeking eternal life with God. I mean, how do we, uh, how do we become a part of that without truth? It was Jesus who said in John 17, 3, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life, knowing God and his Son, and allowing them to become who they are in your life. Today we're living in a cultural war. And it's a clash of, of two worldviews. There's the traditional Judeo-Christian values on one side, and on the other side are those who have abandoned those. And these two worldviews are battling every single day for the hearts and minds of people all across this globe. And they're very different. The biblical worldview is that God not only made the universe, but he made each of us individually. And then he established absolute standards for us all to live by. God established rules for Adam and Eve in the garden. We know exactly there was one tree they were not supposed to eat fruit of. God made that very clear. And he communicated that to them. And they understood that. He later communicated his will for his people in the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And then eventually we know that he communicated through his written word, the Bible. The Bible claims that God inspires all scripture. So we learn God's will for our lives, not by speculation, sitting back and guessing. But we know God's will for us by revelation. God has shared that with us. The secular worldview says that there are no absolute rules. Since we can't know God, people can set their own rules. So each culture, they say, determines what is right and wrong for itself. Abortion, pornography, adultery, homosexuality, they say, they're not wrong, they're just cultural choices. They say one culture may believe in monogamy and fidelity, but another culture believes in polygamy and sexual freedom between consenting adults. And they say, who are we to impose our values on others? Who are we to make judgments about what is right and wrong for another culture? They say what matters is that we're tolerant of one another. You know, part of the problem with this is that tolerance has changed. The meaning of tolerance has changed. When our grandparents talked about tolerance as a virtue, they meant that we should respect people and treat them kindly even when we believe they're wrong. But postmodern tolerance, which is what exists in our day, means never thinking that anybody else is wrong in the first place. <laughs> Nobody's wrong. They've simply chosen their own truth. And you and I need to allow them to do that and not 
sit back in judgment of them and try to correct them. The biblical worldview is that our nature is basically sinful. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, they committed the first sin and the entire world was contaminated with a sin virus. And so, ever since then, we are born with a sin nature and it means we have an inclination to sin. We all know that because we've been there and done that on numerous occasions. But we have this inclination to sin just as surely as a garden's going to grow weeds and metal outside in the rain is eventually going to rust. I get tickled in a, a way with folks in our neighborhood that will work to kill their lawn, you know, so that they can reseed. And I love what they're doing. I think it's great, and I understand the premise of that. But, you know, in the spring, their lawn's going to come up nice and green and lush, and they're going to be so excited. But, you know, it ain't going to be long before there's clover. Bermuda grass is going to creep over there somewhere, crab grass. It's just going to happen. Things blow. Dandelions are going to spring up. You know, I understand but it's just going to happen. It's nature. We have a sin nature. Our inclination is to sin. We have to battle that every day. And it starts early. If God says don't disobey your parents, we will disobey our parents before we're even two years of age. My grandson still hasn't learned to talk, but I'm sure no will be one of his first words. And we'll probably hear it. It's just going to happen. If God says, don't take my name in vain, even though there are thousands of names that people could swear by, they choose the name God or Jesus to swear when they get angry or when they want to make a point? Why do they choose those names? Oh, they've been modeled. Well, we all make decisions of how we speak. And may I say a word <laughs> to those of you who got comfortable saying, oh my God, don't go there. We're using his name flippantly. It's easy. Everybody does it. Don't go there. Just stop. Just stop. But we have a sin nature. And our inclination is to go there and to do things that we know are wrong. It's a battle not to do those things. But the secular worldview is that people are basically good. If a person does something that's in violation of an accepted community standard, instead of holding that person accountable, they say we should consider what circumstances led them to react this way. It's not their fault. It's somebody else's fault. If a terrorist slams a plane into the World Trade Center killing thousands of people, rather than calling that behavior evil, Let's just seek to understand what we've done to cause them to hate us so much. That's a secular worldview that all people are basically good. We've just all done something to mess each other up and somebody else is to blame. And this worldview says that if we just create the right environment, people will respond lovingly and peacefully. One view is based on God the creator as absolute authority. The other rejects God and his word as irrelevant because after all, we can figure out what's best for ourselves. That's the mess we're in. That's why it's important. And the third point, to hold on to God and his revealed truth. Hold on to God and his revealed truth. 
on this first Sunday of the new year. I can't tell you how important it is to daily absorb God's word into your life and how important it is to be in learning situations that hold you accountable. It's so important. Because without those two things, you and I who were once here in our faith and our loyalty and devotion to God will eventually be down here. Because that's the drift of humanity. When you take out the anchors, the ship is going to float away. And it's so important that you and I understand that even though when we read the Bible and it isn't some life-changing, lights go off, explosions in the background, we think it's not worth reading. But God through his spirit, through the living word of God is daily shaping your life and your perspective as a follower of Jesus Christ. And you have to submit yourself to that and it's work. It's a daily need. And put yourself in learning situations that hold you accountable. Are you reading through the Bible this year? Find somebody to check on you and to do it with you. But it's important to be in Bible study situations here with a group of people with your Bibles open because as you talk about things and you share, you find that you are held accountable. Your thinking is shaped by the scriptures and the input of other people and your thoughts matter in their lives as well and it helps hold you closer to the Lord because that's our tendency to drift. Paul wrote in Romans 12 too, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul is talking about the drift that's going to happen unless you stop it. Because your stand on God's truth can weaken in the smallest of steps. Because that's often how Satan wants to work. He's not going to go out and try to get you to confess you don't believe in God tomorrow. But each day he's going to chip away and try to move you one little small step farther away from God. And if you're not careful, that'll happen to you. Because that's his, that's his task. That's what he's about. So daily absorb God's word and be in learning situations that hold you accountable. Secondly, be involved in what your children and teens are absorbing and learning. Some of you still have children at home. Some of you have grandchildren um, that you have some time with. It's so important to be involved in what they're absorbing and learning today. And if you're a parent sitting here and still have kids at home, don't make the mistake of thinking that your children share your values automatically simply because you live a good life and go to church. That's not enough. That's important. But it's not enough. Because they're being soaked with the secular worldview every single day in more ways than you and I can count. Their friends, cartoons, if they're that age, music, textbooks at school, television programs, what they have access to on websites and movies influence their thinking in huge ways. Huge. And a couple hours on Sunday, and if they're still small enough that you do a little bedtime story every night before they go to bed, those are great things. But that's not going to counter hours and hours and hours a week of secular worldview propaganda. It's being pushed on them and their thinking is being shaped and changed. And if you don't check that, if you don't know where they're at in the, on the websites, if you don't know what they're watching on television, if you haven't read the textbooks from school, if you haven't watched cartoons with them, 
you haven't listened to some of the lyrics of some of their songs, you don't begin to know. One of the things I've appreciated about Evan is that he is working very diligently to give our parents and our grandparents more more resources to work daily in the lives of their children and grandchildren. He's working to provide things through email or things that, that will help you to talk to your kids about things that are truly going on in their lives, things you need to be careful about. How to discuss certain issues that you might be uncomfortable with. How to be daily engaged in their lives and, and where you're knowing what's going on and you've you developed an even better relationship and that's something he's working on doing this new year and I applaud that. And I hope that you or their parents and grandparents will avail yourselves to those resources and many others. Right now, media, we talk about it a lot. I don't know how many of you are on it. There are more resources on there than you can begin to imagine for parents, single parents, struggles, financial Marriage issues, personal problems, personal growth, tons. And it's, it's there for you and for people you know. So daily absorb God's word, be in a learning situation to hold you accountable. Be involved in what your children and teens are absorbing and learning. And thirdly and lastly, be confident that God's truth will prevail in the end. Be confident that God's truth will prevail in the end. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easy to look around us at the world today and get very discouraged. It's easy to look around and say, we're not winning. <laughs> you know, the biblical worldview is, is buried somewhere. It's, we're not winning. It's easy to get very discouraged, and Satan loves when we are in that position. He loves it. But people can suppress the truth. They can laugh at the truth. They can ignore the truth. They can exchange the truth of God for a lie. But don't get discouraged. The truth always survives and triumphs in the end. It was Jesus that said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. The Bible is a book that will teach you to know God. And you can know him not because you're smart, but because he has revealed himself to you through his word and most perfectly through his son, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who said in John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you today for revealing yourself to us. The Father, we don't have to wonder who you are or live only on speculation. You have revealed yourself. And Father, you do that because you love us. And you understand the way you have made us, the way we're wired. That part of your nature that's within us and your image that we are most fulfilled. And we are functioning as we were created to function. Father, when we are aligned with you and your truth, and we are living for you in a daily relationship that is alive and fulfilling and so worth sharing. Father, we live in a troubled world. It's been that way a long time. But this is the time we know. We can read about things in history books, but Father, the reality we're in today is what we know. And we are so grateful that you are more than sufficient that your truth will not go away no matter how it's smeared and distorted and seemingly forgotten by so many and discarded as useless. The truth does not go away. And we just pray, Father, to be encouraged, to stand tall for you, to live in the ways you've called us to live and 
to show the world what your truth looks like lived in a people in a church a group of followers so thank you so much Father for making your purposes and your will and your love and your holiness known to us we want to know you better but Father more than just head knowledge we want what we know of you to change our hearts and the way we live and we pray this in Jesus name Amen first Sunday of a new year perfect attendance I don't know about you I'm one of those people that always thinks about evaluations at the end of a year and the start of a new year or I made some goals for a new year excited about them time to evaluate. It's time to think about what you're building your life on. And I couldn't help but to think as I was wrapping up this message this week to think about what kind of foundation am I building my life on? What kind of foundation are you building your life on? And can you say with 100% certainty that you're building your life on a rock and that rock is Jesus? Jesus told that wonderful parable in Matthew 7 about building your house that a wise person builds on the rock, a foolish person builds on sand. And this morning as we thought about God and His view and the biblical view and, and the world view and the secular view, one is rock, one is sand. What are you building your life on? I pray 100% you choose the rock, Jesus Christ. Today, if you're not a follower of His, if you've never stated your obedience and been willing to follow what His New Testament teaches us, to believe and to be repentant towards sin and to be willingly to confess before others our loyalty to Him, to turn from things in our lives that we find are, are against what God wants and we're willing to submit in, in baptism and immersion to Him. The baptistry is ready today. It's all ready for you, perhaps. Today could be a great day for that. But make sure you start with that first rock in place, and it's Jesus Christ. This morning, if you're looking for a church home, if you want to continue to build on what's already been established in your life, and you know you need help because we all do. I do. I need you. I'm so grateful for it. I need God the most. But your, your support and your labor and your sacrifices and your, your growth fuels me. And I hope all of us see this this way. And we welcome new people in because they want to grow too. This morning, if you're not committed to this church family, this is a great Sunday to do that. But for all the rest of us, where are you going this year? What are you going to make sure is plugged in your life? What are you building on? Use good, solid material. Don't listen to the world. Love the world, not the things of the world, but love the people in the world because they need Jesus. Show them the way. Commit yourself to do that this year. We're going to stand and sing a song of decision if you'd like to receive Christ today as your Savior to become part of this first this family. I'll be down front to greet you. If you'd rather talk in private, I'll be at the back to meet you after the service. Let's stand together as we sing.